And thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 279, interview with Wes Took, writer and producer of the film Midway. Mr. Took, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it's my pleasure. I, I have to admit to being slightly intimidated because, you know, your guests you often have on are professional historians and, you know, they bring this groundbreaking research and, you know, new interpretations of historical events, whereas <laughs> the, my job is essentially was synthesis. I'm, I like history. I'm fascinated by history. But in this case, it was how do you tell the sprawling story in, you know, two hours? And the only way to do that is to take advantage of you know, all this amazing work by the, the real people who went out there, there and did the work and interviewed these people and went through the old blog books. So right. anyway, it's, it's exciting but intimidating. To be on your podcast. Well, tell you what, if it makes you feel any better, my father was in the Air Force uh, for 25 years, so I was a, a, an Air Force brat. We, an expression we learned very early on was "fake it until you make it." So that's that's we get promotion. <laughs> you just you just do what you got to do, and eventually you get accepted by the men, and, and you move on. So that that's what we'll both do today. How's that? Story of my career. I okay. love it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I know you're a busy man. We'll jump right into this, but before we do, I just have to say. Congratulations on epically telling an epic tale that is the Battle of Midway. The attention to detail, the setting up of the coming battle, which I really enjoyed. The Japanese point of view, which is something new that I really enjoyed. The battle scenes, and we're going to go into all that. But also the human interest component. Um, as the, and that's why I'm glad I'm, I'm talking to you, the writer, versus just another producer, because that was very integral to the story. You tied it all together well. You tell a phenomenal war film, but more than that. But at the same time, it is meant for today's viewers. And so I just wanted to say thank you for the experience that I had. I've seen it three times, and I still get something out of it each time that I see it. Well, I mean, it's a huge compliment when people like you and your audience actually enjoy the film because, you know, people who know something, you have to please both people who knew nothing about this battle and people who know a lot about it. So mm. when people who know a lot about it aren't just horrified by what we produced, it's a, it's a huge compliment. <laughs> right. So let me ask you this. So I, this is obviously a massive project. It probably took quite some time to put together. But how did you become a part of this? So the director of the pro project, this guy named Roland Emmerich, had been obsessed with the Battle of Midway for years. And he actually tried to make a movie in the mid-90s. But at the time, his deal was at Columbia Pictures. Right. So he called up Columbia and said, I found this wonderful screenwriter. I want to make this movie. And they said, well, that's, that's great. But we were just bought by Sony. And um, we're not going to call our new bosses in Japan and tell them that the first major movie we're going to make <laughs> under their regime is about the greatest defeat in Japanese naval history. Good call. So, <laughs> yeah, great call. Uh, that put a pause in it. And then uh, Pearl Harbor came out. So it kind of put another pause in it because that salted the earth for those stories for a little while. Right. Um, and then I happened to be having lunch with him about five or six years ago. And I said, what's the one that got away? And he mentioned the Battle of Midway, and my eyes lit up. Because when I was in seventh grade, I made a diorama about the Battle of Midway. <laughs> and I've always been this kind of amateur military history geek, and I come from a naval family. So I said, you know, if you're still interested in that, and you're willing to take a significant downgrade from the great screenwriter you had in the 1990s, <laughs> as one of my personal heroes, I'm willing to take a crack at it. Wow. That that is amazing. So so you so you you come on board. You tell the story. I'm sure you've done a ton of research. We'll talk about that. But as far as as far as your point of view, uh, besides bringing the story of Midway to a new generation, which obviously it certainly needs it. I think the last Midway film was in the '70s. What were some of your other goals in trying to tell the story? I mean, my personal goal when I first started it was just that you know I read when I was reading these books as a kid. You, mm -hmm it all lived only in your imagination. You know, the Japanese carriers obviously sank. We didn't have a really great idea of what they looked at. They're these kind of these grainy black and white spy photographs. Mm. And, you know, if you go back and watch these World War II documentaries, there are amazing images of various things around the carrier, but much like we do, they didn't think of to shoot them mundane. Right. So you, you never, they never shot what it was like to actually be below decks or, you know, to push a plane across the carrier deck, all these small details. And, just as kind of someone who was fascinated by that world, I thought to be able to bring modern movie to making technology and not just spend you know two hundred million dollars on a superhero movie, right. but to put that those same techniques to use and recreating you know bringing the past to life and making a new generation understand one you know <laughs> how insane this was right. you know just <clears throat> never mind strapping yourself into a dive bomber and turning yourself into a bomb. But just on a routine patrol, you're, being, you're launching off a carrier, which is in itself terrifying. You're going out on radio silence. You have this homing beacon that may or may not work. The carrier may you know, spot a submarine and zig, and suddenly you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with you know, no way to get back. <laughs> Everything they did was just complete 
lunacy. And I, you know, to be able to show people what that looked like felt like an enormous opportunity. Well, there's a there's a word you use several times in the film that pretty much sums up my impression. It's a bunch of cowboys. I mean, you're doing the best you can with limited technology. It, it's up to the humans to make good decisions and, and a bit of luck. So I found that I, I think you did a great job because I had a sense of what it was like to be on a flat top, what was it? What, what it was like to fly a plane, and what it was like to be the tail gunner, which scared me every time they sh- you cut to the <laughs> tail, scared the bejesus out of me. But but no, I think you certainly hit it out of the park with conveying those various things. So uh, my next question is. Um, cause I've seen, I've watched a bunch of YouTube videos of you being interviewed. Uh, could you tell us, tell us the story of how you first learned of Dick Best, which was obviously an incredible character. Now I have to be honest with you and say, as a Southerner where manners are more important than anything, even the truth, when Dick Best first comes on the screen, you've, he's got this really thick New Jersey accent. He's a very combative person. Uh, and I'm like, oh, oh, no, no, I don't like him. I am not going to like him. So, and the other part of that is I purposefully stayed away from watching the um, the, the commercials or the previews of the movie could I, because I genuinely wanted to be told the story of Midway through this film. So I, I did not do any research. I just went in cold. But as you can imagine, by the time the, we get near the end of the movie and Dick Best releases his last bomb, I'm like, hell yeah. So it was, so it was, it was a <laughs> hell of a, a ride, but it was also a story arc with him. And so I, he, and it's all real. He was an incredible person. Fascinating person. I mean, when I was first trying to think about how to tell this story and what you're trying to say, mm-hmm. <clears throat> the idea that kind of brought it together for me was this small fraternity of men who were asked to hold the line in the Pacific, yeah. you know, while reinforcements were being delivered. And this is something that I was, you know, my grandfather was Naval Academy class of 27. He was actually in Eugene Lindsay's class. Wow. And what people forget is how small this fraternity was. And, you know, there, the, Annapolis is only graduating five, 600 men per class. Mm-hmm. So at the beginning of that war, when a ship went down, you almost certainly knew someone aboard it or certainly met someone aboard it. Right. So, you know, I, I said, in, this is, I want to focus on this little fraternity of pilots and who's the pilot who's going to feel emblematic of that journey. And, you know, I, I I don't remember which book it was where I first read that Dick Best had hit two carriers in one day, you know, one of only two guys in history to do it. Right. But then I read this other little, I think it was one sentence and it just said he never flew again because he developed tuberculosis of the lungs. I said, Oh my God, I need to know more about this guy. Right. And, you know, once I started digging, this story is just, you know, you couldn't make it up. If you you made it up, it would feel like cheesy Hollywood nonsense, you know? (laughs) And, Every, everything about him was that, you know, he, they called him Dead Eye Dick. He was, you know, known to be arguably the best dive bomber in the fleet. And he was just this incredibly competitive, combative personality. Mm-hmm. And you realize that that's kind of the perfect metaphor for what the United States had to become at the top of the war. You know, they were, you know, outgunned. They're on their heels. And, you know, you needed someone who's just going to say to hell with it. I'm going to fly anyway. Right. Um, so that's how I, that's how I was led to him. I've I've got to react to that because one of the things that your film did very well for me, for someone who has studied World War II for a very long time, was that at the end of the day, you can have these big, massive carriers, and yes, they're beautiful, and you can have these planes and these bombs and these machine guns and all this stuff, but at the end of the day, it's the human operating it. It takes guts. It takes courage. And you know, they're afraid, you know, they don't want to die. They, they want to go back to their family, but they have a job to do. So these machines of war are impressive, but it's the people operating them that make or break victory. And I was just reminded of that over and over again. Yeah. I mean, the the dive bombers were, you know, the planes they flew are actually kind of emblematic of Dick Best. You know, they happen to be, the Donalds happen to be a great airframe mm-hmm. for the top of that war and that it could, it could just take a beating. It could just take it on the chin. Right. And, you know, the problem is that, you know, the armaments had developed so quickly in the run-up to the war that those poor guys in the torpedo bombers, I mean, that, that plane only came online in 1937, yet by the time the war broke out, it was completely obsolete. Yeah. I mean, it flew 100 miles an hour fully loaded. And those guys knew they were getting in this incredibly, this piece of equipment that essentially had no chance. Right. And yet they got in them anyway. And that, you know, that's both heartbreaking and inspiring. That yeah, that's that's a whole nother. Like you were saying in an interview, that's you know, the greatest generation, though, and that's why to to get back in those planes time and time again, knowing that you could die, but you have a job to do. When you you jump in the plane and you go, that's just what they did. 
Um, yep. Now, as far as you, the writer, I'm again, I'm glad that you're on here as opposed to another producer or whatever, because I can only imagine the research that you had to go through. You've got these three storylines that overlap in the film, but yet you've got to pace it just right. Can you just give us an idea of some of the sources, uh, human books, uh, anything that you might have used in this? I mean, as someone who's fascinated by military history, it was, it was not work. It was genuinely a pleasure. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was actually interesting to catch myself up because I'd read a lot of it as a kid. So, you know, I kind of read the classic Miracle Midway, an incredible victory by Prange and Lord. Right. And, you know, th- those are incredibly detailed, brilliant works that went into the, Ameri- the American side in incredible detail. And they had the advantage of being able to go through our records and interview, you know, veterans and survivors. Right. And, you know... But what's interesting is the way that the scholarship had evolved, and I had not really tracked it. You know, there's this amazing book that came out, I think it was in 2005, called Shattered Sword. Mm -hmm. Um, And what that book did is basically, you know, Frange and Lord had kind of by necessity been forced to take the word of the few Japanese survivors in terms of interpreting what the Japanese side had been doing during the battle. And they weren't able to go over and do a lot of primary research. So you know, there's one admiral in particular, who, Japanese admiral, who kind of had a, a narrative, self-promoting narrative, and he had written a bunch of stuff, and they kind of, you know, they, they didn't really have a choice. They kind of took it at face value. Mm-hmm. And what this amazing book, you know, over the next 30, 40, 50 years of scholarship, um, <clears throat> there was a Japanese side that went in and started looking back at the original Japanese log books and realizing that a lot of what this guy had said was nonsense. Wow. And you know, the first book that really brought that to the American audience is Shattered Sword. And as I was reading it, you're thinking, oh, my God, like all these things that I'd assumed to be true about <laughs> battle were, in fact, kind of different. It's a, it's a wonderful book to go back and read if you're fascinated in, in this uh, story. Mm-hmm. Um, so that really, really informed the Japanese side of the battle. And then also there, you know, there remain these incredible primary sources. So for the co-breaking part, you know, Edwin Layton, who's played so brilliantly by Patrick Wilson, you know, I had always found his story and that intellectual achievement really great. And he wrote this fascinating autobiography called And I Was There, Mm -hmm. um, where he goes into, you know, both what happened at Pearl Harbor and then what happened at Midway and then the rest of his career. And it was actually, he worked on it. it, The stuff wasn't even declassified until the early 80s. And the book actually came out posthumously, unfortunately. Um, But because of that, and because so much time had passed, he was able to go into incredible detail. Um, So if anyone's interested in code breaking, you know, I just... And I think that's a wonderful book to read. And I was there by Layton. That's amazing. And if I could just add on to that real quick, um, I was watching some of the uh, special features from the DVD Blu-ray, which are incredible, by the way. And I didn't realize that Roachford was a high school dropout. Here's a guy that the military brass is probably thinks he's odd, but he's incredible. He's, he's a human machine in, in, in a certain, certain kind of way. Yeah. I mean, Going back and just, you know, they, they did such a nice job of trying to recreate Station Hypo, but walking through that set and thinking about, you know, the physical task required to process a million intercepts, wow. you know, and that it's all done by hand, all logged by hand, and that, you know, you know they, they, they kind of go through the, in that one scene, how little of it were actually cracking and how you would have needed a central processor to crack it, and the central processor happened to be a human brain, exactly. and that, that is fascinating. <laughs> There was one, I was watching one interview with Patrick Wilson. I, you mentioned him just a second ago. He says he's walking on, because y'all did some of your filming in Hawaii on Ford Island, and he says he's walking into one building and there were bullet holes from the Pearl Harbor attack still in the building. And so he, he kind of looked at the camera and he goes, that's when I realized I had to bring my A game. I mean, he didn't want to let anybody <laughs> down the memories. Like, this is real. We've got to make it as real as we possibly can. The attitude on set was amazing. The first two weeks, we yeah, we shot in Hawaii, and you're driving to work. You know, the vans are going past the wreck of the Arizona. Right. And you could just see it in back the crew. Everyone realizes, oh, no, we're not making, you know, a Marvel superhero movie. We're sure. making a movie about real people who went through something real, and we need to approach this with, you know, a real rigor. And I was very impressed by the actors, not just Patrick. You know, everyone had shown up and done some research, and, right. you know, they were talking about what accent they should have, and, you know, they, they just were very cognizant that, the, everyone in this movie is a, was an actual person and that, you know, hopefully some other family or relatives are sitting and watching the, the movie and you want to make sure that you did your best to get it right. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, because you want you want to certainly want to honor that. And 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 to add on to that, one I saw that yeah, like you just said, a lot of the actors w- went out and got research. They bought bi- uh, biographies or they just dove down deep into books because yeah, you want to do the best you can. Um, but yeah, it was just incredible. Um, to go in a slightly different direction, if I may, out of all of the things, out of the many things that I admired about the film, one was setting the stage. Uh, that's come the, the setting the stage for the for the Battle of Midway because America is the underdog and if you ask your 15 year old 17 year old maybe even 25 year old one they probably don't know much about Midway but two they probably can't even comprehend America as the underdog because they just think oh World War II the Allies won how hard could it have been but you set up the scene splendid splendidly for the Midway battle it's only six months after Pearl Harbor everybody's still scared, frightened, worried about an, uh, an invasion on the West Coast. Everybody's morale is down. And um, I guess America is sending most of its resources to the European theater because we had a Europe first policy that was decided by FDR and Churchill. And so the America has got to do something. But at the same time, as, as afraid as they are, the American people are sick and tired of being afraid, and they're sick and tired of, of the humiliation that came from Pearl Harbor, which I think is a very human reaction to a tragedy, something like that. Somebody had to do something because America's pride was injured, and, and you know, we're, we're just as proud as any other nation. Somebody's got to do something. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the, the challenge facing the American Navy at the start of this war must have felt almost insurmountable because emotionally, as you're saying, you know, after Pearl Harbor, the, the instinct is, well, that's where we should throw the punch. But, you know, you're talking about trying to get resources to Europe before England collapses and then suddenly you're facing a United mm-hmm. Fortress Europe and, and then it's a, you know, it's a whole different war. And, you know, the convoys are just getting decimated. And, you, you know, the United States Navy is desperately scrambling and trying to figure out how do we keep the U-boats from sinking all the supplies that we need to conduct this war. So, truly, it was a, the, the task facing, you know, not just the Navy, but also the industrial base in the United States to somehow produce enough ships. You hold the line for long enough that your industrial might could come into play. You could, therefore, be able to fight this war effectively. You know, that was a challenge. And what was, the miracle that was Midway was basically just accelerating the timeline right. that – you know, after Pearl Harbor, the United States, by necessity, is forced to, to pivot away from this battleship-centric sense of the fleet. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's this, I think if certainly if the carriers had gone down in Midway, you're looking at a much longer run in terms of being able to turn the tide of that right. that, that front, that theater. So anyway, yes, I, your, I think your question is very astute. It was, a, it was a huge challenge, and there was this writing that scene with Nimitz <laughs> suddenly realizing he's going to be the guy. And also just Nimitz is such a fascinating character. You know, he had been at the Bureau of Navigation, which was typically the kind of last job you'd get before retirement. Uh, and he's called back yeah. and suddenly he's handed the hardest job in the Navy. And the reason he's handed that job is because King just knows that he's, you know, kind of the perfect guy you need. He's in common presence, but he's this iron will. And, you know, he's incredibly well-respected and he has all these great contacts. And, but, you know, as he says in that in that moment, you're being handed the, the most difficult job in the world. Yeah. Now, and I absolutely love that scene when when the man is when the other admiral is giving. I guess that's King. I'm not sure. I apologize. But when Nimitz is being given that job, they're listing all the things that the Japanese Navy has. And they're listing all the things that the American Navy currently does not have. And yet I still need you to go there and stay out there until victory. I mean, that that's just incredible. Um I, I need to ask, I kind of have a, a, a guy crush on Nimitz. Um, this guy gets this job. He goes out there. He stays calm. I mean, oh, my God, he's got to deal with supply problems. He's got to deal with uh, bad morale. He's got to deal with uh, not having enough weapons. He's got to keep making sure that the Japanese don't come back to Pearl because that was a big fear. But I get the sense that from your film that, He's not going around like maybe Churchill or FDR and giving these very arousing speeches. You just get the sense of quiet, competence, determination, and just just discipline. And maybe that that just kind of emanates from him, goes out to everybody around. And you know how it is in the military. Nobody wants to let the old man down. And I think he quickly becomes, you know, that's our guy. We can't let him down. 
Yeah, there's a famous story about Nimitz when he was working at a shipyard on submarines. He was giving a tour to a congressional group. And while he was giving the tour, his uh, glove got caught in a gear and okay. ground up one of his fingers. He ended up having kind of a mangled finger for the rest of his life. And the story is that he pulled the, 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 the glove out and then continued to give the tour. Jesus. You know, it's just that kind of quiet <laughs> iron will. It's interesting because when we were trying to make the movie, the most important piece of cast, casting was, you know, Woody Harrelson coming aboard, which kind of, you know, a lot of the younger actors respect Woody so much and it ended up being a huge piece. Yeah. But the Navy's panicked because Nimitz is essentially the patron saint in the Navy. Yeah. And it's, oh, God, is Woody going to come in and play Nimitz as, you know, <laughs> right. one of these other kind of larger than life characters? Um, and Woody actually is from a town in Texas near, near where uh, Nimitz was raised. So as soon as he got the job, he went to the Nimitz Museum. And, wow. you know, he showed up on set and was, I think, actually quite intimidated because he knew, you know, one, how much this guy meant to the Navy, but two, that he's this kind of this iconic figure in American life. And as you're saying, he was not this larger-than-life personality. He's just a guy who walked in the room and his kind of sheer force of will and intelligence made people understand and trust that this guy was going to figure out a way to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. It would take someone like Nimitz to make an actor like Woody Harrelson nervous about portraying him. I mean, you're absolutely <laughs> right. So so uh, if I could, this is the part where um, you probably, I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm going to completely geek out because the battle scenes were so incredible, so visceral. And, and I think you were saying this in one of the interviews, you know, you have to wait for a certain level of technology to come along because you can't go out and build characters. You can't build a hundred planes or whatever. You know, you've got to, you've got to use technology to, to do some of the stuff. But if your goal was to make me feel like I was in the pilot seat during the bombing scenes, I just have to say mission accomplished because I'm sitting there grabbing the armrests in the theater, pushing back, trying to keep as much distance between me and the approaching carrier because I feel like I'm about to slam into it. I'm like, Dick Best, hurry up and pull up because you're freaking me out. It was it was that visceral. Yeah, they did an amazing job. I mean, that's, as you say, there's an enormous technical challenge. It kind of, it, this combines a lot of things that a lot of directors are terrified of. There's yeah. planes and water and putting people in a cockpit and then having water exploding is just, it's, if you talk to a VFX house, this would have been, you know, fiendishly expensive even 10 years ago. And if you go back and look at the original Midway, they were actually, rip, you know, they're taking uh, pieces from other films and inserting them. So like there's shots from Tor, Tor, Tor in that oh, Midway because you simply couldn't afford right. to do any of that stuff yourself. Right. So, you know, the challenge for this film is, yeah, Japanese carriers are all at the bottom of the ocean. Sadly, the Enterprise was scrapped in the 1950s, so you can't go shoot an Enterprise. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to recreate all this stuff? And, right. you know, the torpedo bombers were kind of this, this emblematic challenge in that uh, the Navy hated them so much that when those things were decommissioned shortly after the Battle of Midway, they literally just shoved them off the side of these carriers. Oh, <laughs> so oh not a single one exists. Yeah, there's not a single one of those things still on the planet. So. <laughs> You have to hire a guy in Vancouver who kind of hand makes these full scale planes and right. it's shipped on a train over to Montreal and then put on a stage where you build a carrier deck and you're shoving it around. And you're standing on, you know, the set looking at it and it feels like, you know, kind of your childhood imagination and that it, it looks you're playing with these great toys, but you're also staring at this blue wall and thinking, Oh my God, how is it ever going to actually look real? <laughs> and you know, the job they did, they built this crazy gimbal, they put the full-size planes on top of the gimbal, and then when they were in Hawaii, they had a helicopter with a 360-degree camera, and this poor helicopter pilot is, you know, diving as if he's in a dive bomber, <laughs> so he can pick up <laughs> the ocean, and it's shooting in all directions, and that's going to be inserted in the cockpit. I mean, the technical challenge was just off the charts, but yeah, they, you know, those visual effects houses, and certainly Roland, who knows how to shoot this stuff, did a, did a fantastic job. Yeah, that that's incredible. I was when I was watching the special features, I mean, you practically built, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a flat top, the, uh, the, 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 the top part of the carrier where the planes take off and land. And, and you built two, two, I guess, two of the planes. They were uh, replicas or whatever. And I just have to ask real quick, is there any chance one of those replicas are maybe sitting in your backyard? You didn't happen to, uh, to take one of those, did you? <laughs> I begged my wife. I said, sweetie, this Come is a real on. opportunity. We can 
<laughs> we can have this in the backyard. It's gonna be great. We'll barbecue around it. And uh, no, she didn't. She didn't go no, for it. <laughs> I'll never ask for anything again. But no, I I, I should probably <laughs> chose wisely. Yeah. So and going back to yeah. Nimitz for a second, I just wanted to add on to that. So as much as I've read about the war over the years, when I was watching your film, again, I enjoyed the fact that no one's up there kind of like Braveheart giving long, poetic, motivational speeches, b- besides Roosevelt, because that's his job as a politician. But that's not how these guys operated. They had a job to do. It didn't matter that they were kids in their 20s and maybe early 30s, and there was a decent chance that they would die each and every time they went up. They just kind of, this is what we got to do, I'm afraid, but... It's the job we've been handed, so let's get on with it. Just that down to earth attitude. Yeah, that was that was important to me when we were thinking about making the movie. It's like when you there's this kind of snobbery chronology is that when you look back at history, you presume that people who lived a long time ago were just different than us. They're either right. dumber or they you know they they lived by different rules, and also because we've been so preconditioned by the, you know, the epic war movies that we grew up on, mm-hmm. you know that was very much the style. So people told speeches. So I think you kind of imprint on that and presume, well, because it happened in the movies, it must've been the way it actually happened. Right. But when you talk to these guys, or you, you know, you listen to the recorded interviews of them, you realize that they're just like vets now, or, you know, kind of <laughs> the better you are, at your job, the less you talk about it. <laughs> and there's also this, you know, this sense of, yeah, it's, it's, it's my duty to get in that thing and I'm going to do it. And the more I talk about it, the more nervous I'm going to get. So why I'm going to talk about it. And I certainly don't want to listen to some guy give us a long winded speech about what the stakes are, because everyone knows what the stakes are. And the, the real stake is that I'm, I might die and I don't need to be confronting that right before I get my point. Right. Yeah. I, I just loved how accurate that you convey that. It's like, just there's an alarm or there's a message. There's just, just jump in the plane and let, let's go because that's how it was. And I love that accuracy. Now, this next question I'm asking is coming directly from my 15 year old daughter. So you're going to have to put up with me. Okay. So she wanted me to ask if the characters in the film played by Nick Jonas and Darren Chris were actually real life people because and I don't want to give anything away for those who haven't seen it, but when Nick Jonas has his thing, she's like, Oh my God, please tell me that didn't really happen. That really happened. Um, yeah, that was a piece. That's one of those little pieces of research when you're doing it and you, once again, you feel like you've, you've found this. It's almost melodramatic. If you, right. if you invented it, you would feel kind of like you're doing some goofy Hollywood nonsense, <laughs> but yeah, I, there's this, there's this kind of one, there's this, description of many of the books about the enterprise mm-hmm. um there are several books that are specific to the enterprise the one i read the most is called the big e um but it describes in great detail this you know mechanics mate third class bruno gaido who runs out to that spd that's sitting on the deck to fire at the japanese bombers it's coming on, on basically a suicide run mm-hmm. and you read that description and you know it's, there are hundreds of eyewitnesses so it's you know it happened that way but uh, it seems like a, this hollywood movie moment and you can't believe that it actually went down that way it just it, it seems impossible right. so I, I kind of his name stuck in my head and then you know when i was reading through all the pilot reports um you came i came to this thing about this pilot named flaherty who was shot down and interrogated by the japanese and then thrown off a destroyer with an oil can lashed to his feet, mm-hmm. along with his backseat gunner, Bruno Gaida. Right. And that name is distinctive enough that immediately you remember it. And I said, oh, my God, who is this guy? And mm-hmm. all I find anywhere is that there's kind of this one grainy photograph of what he looked like. Um, and there isn't, you know, he's just kind of disappeared from history. Sure. And he said, well, this is one of those opportunities to tell a story about someone who actually did two and one probably two incredibly brave things and you know it's a chance to memorialize a sacrifice that yeah that was incredible when i when i learned that that was real it's like wow again just another average american hero because that's what you had to do now i will tell you this uh i got mad at nick jonas because after the film my wife was like well can you grow a mustache like that and i was like i i think it works for <laughs> nick but not uh no i don't think i could pull that off so we got we got it's hilarious that. to work with it's hilarious to work with someone like nick jonas because you know i, I work with actors but he's in a different category in terms of what people care about online mm-hmm. so he showed up to set and the, the mustache is this incredibly closely guarded secret <laughs> And 
if I grow a mustache, there's no one on earth who cares. If Nick Jonas is photographed with a mustache, suddenly there are you know, 55 million people commenting on it. Right. Oh my God. And yeah. And girlfriends are turning to husbands or guys. Why don't you, you know, why don't you do that? It's like, oh, come on. Just because he grew it. Now I have to grow one, but that's the power of being a star baby. Right. So exactly. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Now, I did want to ask, based, based off your experience with this, because I know this was, on one hand, it was a labor of love, but there's just a ton of work that goes into recreating something like this, no matter no matter the level of technology. But do you, do you think um, either, if you think there might be more World War II films, because I think it is time to, to bring a, a whole series of these out for the for the generation that's out there now. And do you think you would ever be a part of one, uh, another World War II film? I mean, I hope so. I, yeah. you know, I, I think that there's, there's a genuine desire, certainly among the American audience. To, there's something about World War II which feels less complicated. And that, you know, in a moment of political division in our country, to go back to a moment where there was unity and where there's a, a common enemy and there's a reason to pull together and kind of the best the best of what we like to think of as American values shown through. Like mm -hmm. I, I understand why people want to watch those movies. And, you know, there's certainly success. It's world war one, but the success of 1917 also reminds this town. The, the challenge is generally speaking is that they're expensive to make because you have to recreate, if you're going to do them well, you have to recreate these environments and that's sure. not inexpensive. And, you know, increasingly the theater going audience really seems to only show up for these, you know, a superhero in a cape. So, yeah. you know, my hope is as, you know, hopefully costs continue to fall. Um, and maybe there's some other models, you know, that will keep making more of these movies because I, I know the audience interest is there, but mm -hmm. in terms of driving that first opening weekend, it's just, this is a very risk averse town. And, you know, they're always going to reach for the superhero first and you have to, you know, drag them into making something more like this. Right. Well, tell you what, if you do end up making another war film, please give me a call. I'll be your bag man. I'll be your driver. <laughs> I would just would have loved to have been on that set and just watching words that you typed on a page come to life and, and just watch these actors, you know, just give it like that just must've been an incredible experience. Well, it was an incredible experience, and it, you know, it was actually through people like you and, and veterans that the movie ended up being as accurate as I think it is. Because you know, I you know I didn't stir, so the opportunity to have you know people who are in the Navy who came to set mm -hmm. who were making sure that everyone's doing everything right, and a lot of this was some of it to be honest was guesswork. I mean, we had this amazing advisor named Chuck, Chuck Myers who you know served on a carrier in the 1950s, but right. you know in those 10 years, carrier operations and deck operations had changed so much. So he's, you know, he had a, certainly an educated guess on how things would have been run and what the signals were and how the crew would have moved. And we were trying to recreate those things because as I said, you know, if you go back and watch these documentaries, which we did quite exhaustively, they just, they didn't shoot, they shot what they thought was exciting. They didn't shoot the everyday. And we wanted to make sure right. we were trying to get some of the everyday stuff right too.
Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I will. This is gonna. This is gonna sound very mundane compared to everything that you've experienced. But there's one scene with Mandy Moore when she's in the kitchen and she's talking to her husband, and the camera kind of zooms out a little bit, and you can see her countertop. And on her countertop was a box of cereal. Well, just because of the kind of geek I am, I went and I looked it up, and it's like, yes, you actually got the box of cereal right. So again, just between the lingo, the uniforms, the battle scenes, the storyline, the pace of the film, I, I just thought it was. It was incredible, and I just and I'm just I'm glad you guys went through everything you had to go through to make that happen because now there's another thing in my library that I can pull down. It's accurate, and I can enjoy it over and over again. So I just wanted to thank you. Yeah, that, I mean, well, thank you for watching and, and noticing. I mean, the people who worked hard to get those details right appreciate it when people notice it. And that, you know, that scene was fun because they let us shoot at Pearl Harbor, so that's in one of the period accurate houses, um, which had been mothballed wow. because it's under the flight path of the airport now. And, you know, our production designer, Kurt Petroselli, you know, went out and found, you know, anything that was in the shot had to be vetted by him. And, you know, he was sending guys, one of the guys was saying, we're trying to, you know, rebuild these Japanese carriers, and it was incredibly hard to figure out exactly what they would look like because they were so classified before the war. So he ended up having researchers going through Tokyo bookshops and found this book with these amazing photographs that they kind of, you know, somehow snuck through that no one, he couldn't go on Amazon and find this book, but he was able to find it. And therefore, when you're on, you know, those Japanese ships and you're wondering, what does the pipe look like? How is it painted? Well, he's pulling all that stuff from actual historical photographs. That That's incredible. Again, as like you said earlier, must have been a complete labor of love. Um and I can only imagine how you must have felt after it was all done. You you breathe a sigh of relief, but you're like, well, that part of my life, I don't know. You, you feel like you wish you could go through it again just because it must have been that incredible to deal with all those people. It's, it, it's also because it was not a studio film. So, you know, right. I've been working on it for years, and then they found the independent financing, and I was flying out to Hawaii for the first day of shooting, and I was, I was actually thinking as I was in plane, you know, there's a chance that I will land and that I will learn that the – the movie isn't happening. There was never the sense of certainty that we're just, oh, we're going to make it. So wow. every day on set felt like this miracle of, oh, we get to do this. This is, this is incredible. However, it turns out, I will never forget, you know, being able to climb up onto the wing of a Dauntless and, you know, talk to a guy who's wearing a perfect period replica of a pilot's costume. It was, you know, all that stuff as a history fan was just a dream. So, yeah, I was going to say, it's so it basically sounds as good as I would imagine it, it, it was to have been there. So I'm very jealous. So congratulations to you and, and to everyone else. And I did hear in another interview that I watched you on YouTube that um, you were talking about all the things that could have been in there. Because obviously there's just so much to the story, especially when you're talking about not just the battle itself, but building up to to Midway. So, of course, as a as a history buff, I always, always wanted to ask you, where's the six hour version of this movie? But but I guess that's what the DVD and all the special features are for, to satiate people like me. Man, I, I just, I, I've said that and I meant it. I really wish you could do a 10-hour miniseries of this. You know, the, econ- <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the economics are impossible, but w- what, a, what a joy that would be to be able to really dive into some, You know, there's so many untold stories. And that was the fun thing about when the movie came out, going around and talking to people. And people would say, well, my, my grandfather and my father did this. And, you know, why didn't you tell that story? And you say, I'd love to tell that story. It's an amazing story. And I hope that... The movie coming out gives people an opportunity to talk about, you know, what, you know, their relatives did or, you know, Mm -hmm. remind people that, you know, this is just a little piece of a larger story and, you know, bring attention to this incredibly pivotal and monumental event. And and I think if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have your own connection because your grandfather graduated the same year as the character played by uh, Darren Chris. Correct. Eugene Lindsay. Yeah. 1927 Naval Academy. Wow. Um, that, yeah, yeah, he was, and you know, he's kind of this, he was a, a classic story from the time. He was, his dad had tuberculosis and passed away and he was, in, he kind of grew up in a sanitarium and was the youngest kid accepted in the Naval Academy his year and was this little beanpole of a guy and ended up going and getting <laughs> a degree in Naval architecture. And I, you know, I've been working on this project for five years and the movie came out and then I was sitting with my dad this last Christmas and I, you know, I gotten this question from a publicist. Well, you know, is there any more direct connection between your grandfather and the movie? And I said, Dad, like, did you, did you know? I know he didn't do hull design, but was he in any way involved with any of these ships? And he goes, Oh yeah, he probably worked on Enterprise. I said, What? Wow. <laughs> he said, Yeah, in 1936, he was, uh, he was in D.C. at the. Uh, at the uh, design bureau, basically. And uh, yeah, he's he a junior architect, but I'm sure, you know, that was one of the, you know, she was in there being retrofitted. I'm sure that that was one of the big ships that he did work on. 
And I'm just wow. staring at him thinking this, somehow this hasn't come up, but that's, <laughs> you know, kind of the sad story about a lot of these things. Like we, a lot of us have relatives who did things and you don't ask the questions and somehow therefore, you know, the legacy of what they did isn't passed along. You, you kind of have to, having these things, opportunities to go back and ask people what they did or, you know, regardless of where they were, it, you know, before it goes away, that's, that's invaluable. Exactly. Exactly. We should be asking all of our relatives because one day all the veterans will be gone and you want to be able to get as much you know, because you want to honor them. And so you want to have as much information as you can, because at the end of the day, you want to know what they went through. And because of their sacrifice, hopefully there won't be another war and and we can just keep making films and reading books and we won't have to experience it ourselves. Absolutely. They're, they were, you know, they brought four Midway veterans to the premiere in Los Angeles, which was, I think, incredibly powerful for people who watch the movie. They, they did a little um, YouTube video about them watching it for the first time, which I, I find very emotional. Um, right. But as part of publicity for the movie, they actually sent me out to Midway, which was incredible. And one of these veterans had been talking about being in this little pillbox. And there's this pillbox on the beach that's kind of being consumed by the water, sinking into the sand. And I was just standing there staring at it, thinking, you know, this very well could be the pillbox that you described. And, right. you know, this is a, a gentleman at the end of a very long and very interesting life who has this story, and I'm just glad he's able to tell people about it. Um, I mean, just going, going to Midway in general was, was fascinating. You know, the, you're flying in over this place that you've described so many times because it's now part of a you know, national wildlife refuge. You know, it's very limited access, so it's very special mm-hmm. to be able to go out there. But you're staring down at Eastern Island, which is where the old airfield was, and, you know, the airfield, is, they've tried to restore it. So, you know, the island has been totally overgrown, but you can see the little outline of the original airfield. And, you know, you know that's where the planes were taking off from in 1942. And then there was this, you know, the RV Petrol, which is a undersea exploratory vessel, was there mm-hmm. um, to go and try to find the Japanese carriers, which they did. They found Kaga and Akagi. Um, wow. And, you know, the, the footage hadn't been released yet, but they sit in their control room and they're pulling up the camera shot of the first time that the you know, superstructure of Kaga looms into view and you're just watching as the camera plays over this thing that no one has seen since, as you know, once again, since 1942, it's been the bottom of the ocean. And she's so, she's so deep. I think it's almost 6,000 meters that, you mm. know, there's very little algae buildup. So, you know, the, there's an opportunity one as historical documentation to, you know, figure out exactly, you know, how she went down and you could see, how the fires must have raged on her because everything kind of above the waterline is twisted and mangled by fire or is everything below the waterline looks exactly as it did because it's been so well preserved. And you also realize it's very emotional. You're you're looking at the tomb of, you know, hundreds of Japanese sailors who went down when they were fighting those fires. And anyway, it was uh, very powerful to be able to go out there. Yeah, and and I hope they uh, I because I know that takes a lot of money, but hopefully people keep um, giving money and they can keep finding these vessels because again, the the stories are incredible. It just needs to be told. Um, I certainly want to encourage everyone to get the uh, the DVD, the Blu-ray. You will certainly love the special effects uh, if you when you get that. Um, what I would do is you get the DVD, go out and get the biggest screen you can, get surround sound, and experience the Battle of Midway for yourself. And and Mr. Took, thank you very much for spending your time with us and thank you for your part of making this movie become a reality well, i appreciate your time and uh thank you to your audience for being so interesting history it's you know the reason that hopefully we'll get to keep making these so we appreciate it